Coast Fellowship meeting. I believe it was the last time you guys held it. Um, love your pastor, JC, and really enjoyed that beautiful singing this morning. And the prayers that were offered would ask that you continue to be in prayer now for the preaching portion of the service. If you have your Bibles with you, please open to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. This is going to be somewhat of a funny topic, but I've already warned one of the brothers that uh, I was brought up primarily from um, Glenn Blanchard and Winter Garden, so Glenn Blanchard might come out a little bit this morning. Uh, I want to try to address two questions, try to answer two questions for the time that we have before you this morning. The first question is, what bores you? What bores you? (laughs) And the second question is, what does God find exciting? What does God get excited about? I don't think it's an underestimation to say that we live in a country full of bored people. They will just they will do just about anything to try to quench or kill that craving to do something because they're so bored. They're experimenting with new things that are sinful. I really think about the definition of uh, boredom. They say feeling weary and impatient because one is unoccupied or lacks interest in one's current activity. I literally saw a T-shirt this past week of a guy, middle aged guy who's wearing a T-shirt that says, you bore me. I thought, I don't really care that I bore you. I had an elderly friend. He was a, kind of like a mentor of mine. He was uh, on up in his 80s, and he passed away about this time last year. Um, he was just a generally benevolent guy. He was a Christian all his life and just a patriotic American. He was generally just an all-around good guy. And, um, he kept teaching me things even when he, was, he wasn't trying to. And again, one of those little things that he just mentioned in passing that has stuck with me is that People get bored when they don't enjoy doing what they ought to be doing. Thank you, sister. People get bored when they don't enjoy doing what they ought to be doing. So it follows that if you know what you ought to be doing, let's, let's just say following the Word of God, you've got plenty to do. You've got a lot that you, that's always on your Christian to-do list. You should never be bored. But if you don't enjoy doing those things, you're not going to do them. You're going to find, you're going to want to find other things to do. And that's actually, we see an example of that in Ezekiel chapter 16. You don't have to turn there. Um, Ezekiel chapter 16, the nation of Israel is going through a really sinful period. And God actually equates them with the city of Sodom. Remember the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah? Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 49 says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister, Sodom. He's talking to Jerusalem and he's calling Sodom their sister. These are the sins. Pride fullness of bread and abundance of idleness. Jerusalem had the word of God up to that point. They had plenty of scripture to go by. They didn't want to do it. They were bored all the time and they were just like Sodom. We could say, husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Well, if you don't enjoy your husband or you don't enjoy your wife and you get bored, that's going to lead to problems, bad relationships. Or we could say, children, obey your parents. Have you ever gotten bored with your parents before? (laughs) That can lead to some rebellion there and making some bad choices. Children, listen to your parents. They've been around longer than you. They're wiser than you. Or, this may hit a bit closer to home for lots of us, um, if you have a job, uh, we are told in Colossians to work as unto the Lord and not unto men. That's going to set a high standard. Is you're working, even if you have a jerk for a manager or a supervisor, you're working as like the Lord is your manager or your supervisor, your CEO. He's watching you. He's right over your, your shoulder. And so even if your manager is a jerk, you're going to be setting a really high standard. You're not going to be cutting corners. It's going to be energetic work because the Lord's right there with you. But if you get bored with that, you start seeing opportunities to cut corners, to make things easier on you, Um, it's going to make it easier on you and it's going to be a problem later on that can give your, your jerk manager actual good reason to get on to you whenever you do start acting bored and lazy. 
I had you turn to Luke chapter 2 because I want to look at some very simple lessons about how to fight boredom. We're applying the Word of God to every aspect of our lives this morning. And even fighting boredom is one of those. And the shepherds have a lot to teach us about that in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. But before we get there, I just want us to think for a few moments about a few other biblical examples of people that got bored all throughout Scripture. You can think about the people of Israel in the Old Testament during their wilderness wandering years. You know, whenever they were wandering through the wilderness, what did the Lord feed them? Manna. Literally means, what is it? What's it? They didn't know what it was. But the Lord fed them. They didn't know how the Lord was going to provide for them, but he did. And he took care of them. At first, they were, they were happy to have that. But then they got bored of having manna for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Having manna cereal, uh, scrambled manna, uh, fried manna, sautéed manna, manna kebab. They got tired of having manna in all its different forms. They grew bored of it. And then what did they ask for? They said, give us flesh. And if you read the story, you know that the Lord did give them quail. And he gave them so much quail that he said they were going to have so much quail that going to be coming out of their nostrils. Kind of gross you know, to think about. But they got bored of having the same old thing. You may be going through a season in life where it seems like you're just doing the same thing day after day, week after week, same old thing. You're getting tired of it. You're getting bored with it. You're still called to faithfulness. You're still called to take delight in the Lord. He's still providing for you. We can think about David, King David. It was a long period of time between the time that he was anointed king and the time that he actually became king. He was recognized as king. And there was a time whenever he would have done anything to finally be in that position of power. But whenever he finally did get there, and it seemed like everything in the kingdom was on autopilot and everything was running smoothly, The nation was at war, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Instead of being there on the front lines, dealing with the battle that was going on, he went up to his rooftop. You know, he saw Bathsheba. He made the biggest mistake of his life. He got bored with the authority, the dominion that had been given him. So that kind of goes back to our jobs. Um, There was a time for me whenever I prayed that the Lord would give me a job. I prayed that he would give me a job that I could be good at, that I could enjoy, that I could um, excel at. Um, and right now I've, I've got two part-time jobs. I uh, stock shelves in a grocery store and I coach CrossFit, something I'm really passionate about. But the Publix job, um, I've actually gotten so good at it because they don't get a lot of energetic young guys that are able to move fast and be on their feet all day long, pick up heavy boxes, move heavy stuff in the back hall. I've gotten so good at that, good at it that I've been recognized as somebody that can train the new people whenever they come in. They trust me with that responsibility. But oh, there are days that I hate that job. I could get bored with that position, and I can see opportunities to cut corners, get lazy. Of course, I'm not looking at Bathsheba, but I'm also looking at something that's pretty tempting. You could cut that corner. You could probably come up with some analogy for your job. What about King Solomon? Solomon's another example of somebody that got bored. Uh, Kings, leaders in the nation of Israel were commanded to continually be reading the law of the Lord. They were called to continually be uh, studying it and to just have their minds set on it. Don't get distracted with what the world is teaching. But what what happened to Solomon's mind? Why was he such a downcast figure by the time that we read about him in Ecclesiastes? Over time... His, wife, his strange, strange wives, the Bible's language, not mine. Um, his wives led his heart astray, but on top of that, he also started dabbling in the world's philosophies, the world's wisdom. He wasn't satisfied with what the Word of God had to say, and he started searching what the world had to say. And I've met so many Christians that they're, at first they're so excited to study the Word of God, but then they're like, have you heard about the, the book of Enoch? Or like the, the gospel according to Mary? Or, or Thomas? How about the, the Psalms of Solomon? Those, those the apocryphal books. Extra biblical garbage. And they start studying them. And they want, they want to study these things that the Bible is silent on. The Bible doesn't have anything to say about it. Some of it's heresy. Some of it's just garbage. But their minds get so warped by it. They get so discouraged. And they don't seem to care about that. They just get led astray from the faith. They're in the Word of God. And that's why we find Solomon in such a confused, groaning state by the time we read him in Ecclesiastes. 
And then a New Testament example we read is in Luke chapter 15. Um, you remember the parable of the prodigal son. Remember what he told his father? Give me the inheritance that falls to me. Which is another way of saying is, you're dead to me. Give me the inheritance that I deserve. You died. Give me that inheritance. I want to go do what I want to do. He got bored of living at home. Some children, around the time that they're 16, 17, they're just so ready to get out from underneath their parents' control. They want to go get a tattoo. They want to drink. They want, you know, they want to spend time with friends. The prodigal son grew tired of living at home, only to grow tired of what's out in the world, too. Have I hit a nerve yet? Have I hit a vein? Any of this relatable to you guys? <laughs> maybe, I've got, maybe I've got too big of a needle here. Well, we're going to start in Luke chapter 2. Many of those examples um, hope to cover. Some of this will be relatable for us, I hope, um, a less, very practical lesson for us in fighting whatever bores us most, whether it's your spouse or your job or ch- even church. I hope church does not bore you. We're going to look at some examples here, some simple lessons that we learned from Luke chapter 2 about how to fight being bored. (laughs) Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, shepherding was a very necessary job. It was a needed job in the nation of Israel. They had a lot of sheep to take care of. So, You've probably heard that, you know, shepherds were a despised people in the first century. And to a degree, that's, that's, that is uh, true, but um, not exactly. There is some truth to it, but not entirely. Um, some people in the nation of Israel actually admired the shepherds' you know, tenacity to stick with that boring job. To stay around those stinky, filthy animals day in, day out, keeping watch over them, making sure they're all right. And sheep were, you know, a necessary part for the nation of Israel's economy, too, for the meat and, you know, their, their coats. They were a very needed people. But, like I said, because they were around these animals all day and all night, they kind of stunk. The animals, just their stench got on them. So they were kind of like on the fringe of society. Because they're so busy with these sheep, they didn't have time to go out and spend time with their family and their friends as much as they wanted to. And because they were around these animals, it often meant coming in contact with blood. And that meant they could not go to temple worship because they were considered impure. They had to go through some purification rites, which took time. And that often did not line up with temple worship. It says they were abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. I'll just say that this was a boring night at work for them. It says they were keeping watch over their flock by night. I've heard about a practice that um, shepherds would spend all day making a sheepfold or a pen of of big rocks or a whole bunch of smaller rocks. They would make a pen out of these rocks and the sheep would go inside and they would leave like enough space for a little gate to go in and out of. But the shepherd himself would serve as the gate. He would lie between it, you know, with his feet propped up at one end. And even Jesus himself says, I am the door of the sheep. And it keeps the sheep in, and it keeps other animals from getting in. There's nothing that tells us that these shepherds were doing a bad job. Not bad guys. They were keeping watch over their flock by night. It was really boring, but they did it. So, first lesson to fight boredom, be faithful despite the boredom. Or, don't use your boredom as an excuse to sin. These shepherds, they could have abandoned their flocks. They could have said, I had it. I've had enough of this. They could have thrown their staff down. I want to go become a musician. And they could have pursued something else. But this is what they were called to do. They were needed where they were. So if you're called, if you are where God wants you to be, remember that. Be faithful despite the seasons of boredom that we may go through. We'll keep reading. Verse 9, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Now, I I just kind of have to snicker a little bit whenever an angel tells us, fear not, or tells somebody to fear not. Because put yourself in the shepherd's shoes, or, or sandals, if you will. It was just, like for a moment, it was just an ordinary dark night, middle of the night, it was dark outside. And all of a sudden, it's just shining brighter than day, and there's this glorious but intimidating figure standing before you. That's not usual. That's not normal. 
And so these these shepherds are looking at each other like, um, are we in trouble? Did we die? But the angel has to tell them, fear not. And we keep reading. Verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, here's the first Christmas carol, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Peace on earth. People will do just about anything to have peace in their lives, won't they? They will. They, they attach their peace, what they think will give them peace to so many different things, whether it is their family or a vacation or finally getting that nice car or uh, getting the perfect golf swing, being recognized for something that they their, their hobby or something. They'll attach peace to anything that they can in this world. But they forget that this world is temporary. So if we attach our peace to something in this world, that peace is going to be temporary too. Our peace has to come from somewhere else. What better place to get it than the Prince of Peace himself? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen, brother. I'll amen, I'll amen myself. Because that was a good point. It's been my experience that if you are bored, you're not at peace. If you're bored, you're not at peace. And so, this lesson about spending time with the Prince of Peace, that's the lesson. If you're bored, you're not at peace. So take being bored as like a warning sign. I'm feeling kind of bored. That means I'm not at peace. That means something's wrong. You've got you to change something. And so you've got to spend time with the Prince of Peace. He's coming. He has come for us. For the shepherds, He was coming. He said, well, how do I spend time with the Prince of Peace? I don't... It sounds wonderful to preach, but to hear preach, but how do I do it? It makes me think about something that the Apostle Paul told us to let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Okay, preacher, how do I do that? Spend time reading his word. Spend time reading the words that Jesus Christ himself has said, what the Prince of Peace himself has said. And his words will become real to you. Spend time in prayer, talking to the Prince of Peace. And you may be blessed with a sense of his presence. Spend time in fellowship with other believers who follow the Prince of Peace. And you may look back on that and think, Jesus Christ was there. He was with that meeting. He was with that service. That's how you spend time with the Prince of Peace. Spend time reading His Word, praying, spend time in fellowship, singing. In fact, you can actually just look at like verses 10 through 14, what we just read. These shepherds, they didn't have much of a choice. We have a choice to hear these things nowadays, but these shepherds got to hear a gospel sermon. Fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That's gospel preaching right there. That's the gospel message. Christ has come. And then what else did they hear? Gospel singing. They heard the angels singing. Y'all sounded beautiful this morning, by the way. But I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Not, not, I don't think anything can compare to the angels singing right now. But they got to hear gospel preaching and gospel singing. Expose yourself. Be a part of worship. So that's another lesson to fighting boredom is listen to gospel preaching, be a part of worship. And that can help ward off the boredom. Verse 15. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, after like a moment of being flabbergasted, dumbfounded, they said one to another, let us now go, go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. They didn't stop and say, man, I knew we shouldn't have had McDonald's for dinner last night. Can't trust this anymore. They didn't doubt what they had heard. They believed it. And then get this in verse 16. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. It says that they came with haste. Now, haste in Scripture and in the world, haste can be a good thing. It can also be a bad thing. We have that saying, undue, or undue haste makes waste. Haste can be a good thing or a bad thing. And the bad kind of haste could be described as this sense of always feeling late or thinking that you, you always have to run. You always have to say, bye-bye, I've got something to do. 
or uh, you're itching to leave all the time. You, know, you put the, put this into a 21st century perspective. Um, maybe there's a person in your life that you occasionally come across. Maybe it's just an acquaintance, a coworker, fellow student. I don't know. Um, they're not necessarily a bad person, but maybe they annoy you just enough that you don't want to talk to them. Or maybe they send you a message occasionally and they, they want to text or call. He's like, oh, I don't really want to talk to them. And so you come up with any excuse that you possibly can to cut the conversation short and just get away from that person. That's undue haste. You may be the most godly influence that person may have in their life. So spend time with everybody that you can, witnessing to them. And that actually brings us to the next point, but I won't get ahead of myself. Um, there are a few examples of uh, bad kind of haste in Scripture that we read. Psalm 31, verse 22. You don't have to turn there. Where David himself says, For I said in my haste, this is the bad kind of haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. That's not true. You're never cut off from before the Lord's eyes. If you're one of his people, he's always watching over you. Haste made David come to a wrong conclusion about God. And he actually acknowledges that in the same verse. So nevertheless, let me hold on, let me correct myself. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 16 says, For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. And then Proverbs 28 and verse 20 says, A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. You know all these get-rich-quick schemes out there nowadays? One in a thousand might be true. The rest of them, you're not going to be any richer just by following them. So there's a good kind of haste and there's a bad kind of haste. Uh, the good kind of haste I would describe as instant, excited obedience. Just like these, uh, the shepherds here says that they came with haste. They heard the good news. They did not delay. And that actually reminds me of Psalm 119, verse 60. The psalmist says, I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. So it's another lesson in fighting off boredom. Make haste to follow the word. Don't make any excuses. Don't wait till you feel like it. Emotions. Our hearts can become a tangled mess of emotions that will keep us from doing the right thing. Don't let it. Do the right thing. Make haste to follow the Word of God. And then I mentioned, you know, making haste just to, to talk to people and evangelize. Let's read up to, let's see, verse 17. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So everybody that the shepherds came in contact with, whether that was a few people or a lot of people, over the course of their lives, they talked about this event for the rest of their lives. And they shared it with others. They evangelized, in other words. And I encourage you, it is very hard to get bored whenever you're evangelizing. Whenever you go into work with the mindset I want to spread just a little bit of gospel truth. You don't necessarily have to invite them to church or get a full confession out of them. Just spread a little gospel good news at work, at school, at home, wherever you spend time with family, friends, daily life. Spread a little gospel news. Evangelize a bit. You can even evangelize while you're here in the church. Spread the good news to each other. Evangelize whenever you can. That's what the shepherds did. They had just witnessed. Now, Really, let's put ourselves back into their sandals again. These shepherds had just witnessed the beginning of the greatest event in history. The birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. They just witnessed that. This could be a possible escape from their boring life of shepherding day in, day out. To quit their jobs and become some of the first preachers the world had ever seen. First gospel preachers the world had ever seen. They could have gone all throughout the nation of Israel and Jerusalem and preaching this good news, go on speaking tours, go down in history. But that's not what they did. We read in verse 20, and the shepherds returned. This is one of those moments when you're reading the Bible, they would be like, what? They returned? They went back? Why? They had such boring jobs. Why would they go back to that? And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. 
they returned. This needs to be said that God was pleased that they returned. They were where God wanted them to be, shepherding. God was pleased that they returned. And you can picture these, these old men, these, these shepherds, closer towards the end of their days. They're, they're elderly. They're, um, they've got their great-grandkids next to them by the fire. The sheep are all huddled up in their pen. The shepherds are just a little ways off with all their grandkids. And they're, they look over to their grandkids and they say, Did I ever tell you about the time that, that angel came down, startled us, and told us the gospel news, and we heard angels sing, Yes, Grandpa, you've told us a hundred times. These men that had worked so hard, that had a layer of dust and dirt that is just infused on their skin from spending so much time outside with those animals, they were now enlivened. They had reason to rejoice and glorify God every single day of their lives. I say we've got the same good news, don't you? We're told and we're taught in Philippians chapter 4 um, that contentment is a good thing. Paul teaches us to be content with our circumstances. He's learned to be abased and to abound in all things, um, whether he's suffering need or he's, he's got so many possessions that he can't even keep track of it all. He's told to be content. And yeah, contentment is, is a good quality, but if you're content and you're bored, to be clear, boredom itself is not a sin. But the activities that can result from boredom almost always are sins. Contentment is good, but to just abide in quiet contentment and being bored but not complaining, that's not enough. Because we have reason to rejoice today, tomorrow, next day after that, next week, next month. We have reason to rejoice for the rest of our lives like these shepherds did. They rejoiced the rest of their days. And it is the easiest thing in the world to become lukewarm. You understand that? Is becoming lukewarm just like everybody else that they've, they've put their excitement, their reason to be excited in, in one thing or another. That thing dies out and they just they get bored. Your hope in the gospel, that should never die out. This should always keep us excited. And I know we, we're quick to agree with that, but do we live it? Let's live it out. Starting today, let's be excited about the gospel. And so that's the, the point. The last thing is return. The last point about fighting boredom is to return. What if, remind yourself, what if you are already where God wants you to be? Those shepherds were. They returned, and they returned glorifying God. So we've talked about what bores you. I hope I've addressed something that um, you can relate with there and, and what we get bored about. But then the second question, what does God get excited about? And this was something that I, I really had to, to dig in Scripture to find. And um, just so you guys don't think I'm being irreverent, um, there is this attribute of God, of God called impassibility. It literally means God is not given to passions like we are. Like, I'll give you an example. If you hear a genuinely funny joke, let's say it's a clean joke. You hear a genu genuinely funny joke, you kind of have to like resist the urge not to laugh. Like, you want to laugh so hard, but you've got to fight it. Scripture tells us in Psalms 37, I believe it's uh, verse 15 or so, God laughs at the wicked. God laughs. But he has complete control over when he laughs. Like whenever we hear a joke, we have to resist the urge to laugh. God, he, control, he completely controls when he laughs. If he hears a funny joke, he can choose to laugh. He can choose not to laugh. Or let's say um, you witness, or maybe, ladies, it happened to you, you witness the perfect, the picture-perfect, unforgettable proposal by your husband your, or some other guy proposing to his wife-to-be. Picture-perfect. And you, you have to contain yourself for the joy of the scene. It's, you know, it's just, just that happy scene. And you have to contain that in. Joy is just overflowing. God experiences joy. I mean, he exhibits joy. But joy does not overtake him. He controls joy. Joy does not control him. How about anger? Uh, you turn on the news nowadays and it won't take long before you get upset with something that's happening in the world. 
something that people are protesting. You witness some injustice. People are protesting for some right, this, this thing that ought not to be legal. And you get angry. Or maybe you get sad from witnessing how far things have, have fallen. Whether you get angry or sad, you kind of have to dial that back in. You kind of have to control it yourself. Well, God doesn't have to. He controls wrath. He controls this uh, a sense of grief. He controls those emotions or passions, as we may call them. They don't control him. So whenever I say that there are things that God gets excited about, understand I'm using that word just a little loosely. We are told that God does exhibit joy, that God does exhibit delight, and we're actually going to look at those scriptures. Two things that I believe God gets excited about. The first, you probably already guessed this, God gets excited about salvation, bringing his people into his family. If you would turn to 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, and then while you're turning there, I just want to read this passage from Hebrews chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, the right hand of the throne of God. It says that there was joy set before him. The joy that before him. He took joy in saving his people. Now, there from 1 John uh, chapter 3, in verse 1, we read the words, these unforgettable words, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Now, a little interesting tidbit, little fact. Um, punctuation did not exist in the first century. You know, when the Hebrew and Greek uh, were, were written, um, when the first, when the New Testament was written, punctuation didn't exist. There were no such thing as periods, commas, quotation marks. Um, you just kind of had to read into the language to figure it out. So, in a sense, punctuation isn't technically a part of the Word of God, uh, the original. And that's why every single time that I read a commentary on First John chapter three, they, they they don't hesitate to say, "Behold." Because that word, behold, literally means stop everything and pay attention to this. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, us, unworthy, undeserving, unlovable sinners. He's bestowed that on us, that we should be called the sons of God. That's the purpose. The love that he set on us has made us sons. That word sons literally means children, both sons and daughters. That we should be called His children. It's a love that transforms us into from sinners, dead alien sinners, into His beloved children. That verse is very dear to me, and I hope it is to you. And that's something that um, should be continually amazing us. This is something that God wants us to take note of. And you may have already heard this. Brother J.C. has probably already brought this to light many times. But if you remember, the Apostle John, whenever he's writing these words here in the first epistle of John, he's already an elderly man. He's lived a full life. He was basically there since the very beginning of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. He got to, to witness water turn to wine. He got to witness people raised from the dead. He got to witness thousands of people fed with a few loaves and fish. He got to witness so many miracles throughout his lifetime and those few years that Christ was there. You would think that somebody who's seen such amazing things like Christ walking on water would be would make John kind of hard to amaze. You know, it's like if, if John went on a roller coaster, would he be like, mm, I've seen more exciting things. It's something that continually amazed the Apostle John was this love that God has bestowed on us. Behold. Take note of this. Stop everything. Pay attention to this. In fact, if you, if you back up to 1 John chapter 2, um, John has this little section of a, of a picture 
that he writes about a, a healthy church. A healthy church is composed of little children, young men and young women, fathers and mothers, different spiritual age groups where everybody falls into in the church. And he addresses the little children twice in verse 12 in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 12. He says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And then again, towards the end of verse 13, he says, I write unto you, little children, because you have known the father. So two things that the Apostle John wants the the new believers, the little children, so to speak, the, the people that have just been converted, the people that are just coming to understand the gospel, they just joined the church. They just got baptized, however you want to word it. They're new believers. Um, he want, Two things he wants them to understand. Your sins are forgiven for Christ's namesake. That's in verse 12. Because your sins are forgiven, forgiven you for his namesake. And then God is your father. You have known the father. Two things. If you ever feel like you're getting kind of tangled up in your Bible studies, you don't know what to study next or really how to keep moving forward in your studies, I'd encourage you to take a step back. Think about these two points and try to comprehend how deep they are. Your sins are forgiven for Christ's namesake. And God is your Father. Just those two points are... I can't wrap my mind around them. I've tried. I've tried, tried to study them and preach them. It seems like I am just keep scratching the surface. But they are incredibly powerful to enliven our faith, to to keep us going. And that's the love that he talks about there in in chapter 3 and verse 1. The manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. This amazed John even in his old age. And I say it should be continually amazing us even as we get older and older. So that's number one. What, does God, what amazes God or what gets God excited? What does God find exciting? He gets excited about salvation. He gets excited about bringing people into his family. And then the second thing that I think God gets excited about is whenever we act like a member of that family. Matthew chapter 12. Actually, I'll just read it to you. You don't have to turn there. You can turn there if you want, really. Matthew chapter 12 and then starting at verse 47. Jesus is preaching a sermon and... Someone comes through the crowd to say, then one said unto him, behold, hey, or you could picture it as like a, hey, Jesus, that sort of thing. Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. He equates obedience, following the will of the Father, with being a member of the family. Now, we understand that nothing can separate us from the love of God. The prodigal son, even whenever he was living that life of disobedience, he was still the son of his father. He just wasn't in fellowship with him. We understand that difference there. But Jesus equates obedience with being a part of the family. The ones that obey the will of the Father, they are Christ's brethren. That's what Jesus himself says. And then we turn over to Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 27. This is another aspect of, I'd say, acting like a member of God's family. Where Jeremiah says, or the Lord says, but let him that glorieth, glory or or brag about the things that he's done, but him that glories, glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. He's acquainted with me, his heavenly Father. That I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now, we, we just got through talking about how the Lord loves us. The Lord loves us, unworthy sinners. You say, well, yeah, duh, God, God is love. God loves sinners. No, he doesn't. God does not love sinners. God loves righteousness. Think about that for a moment. Are you righteous in yourself? I certainly am not. The only reason we are counted as righteous is because of the sacrifice of his dear son, Jesus Christ. His righteousness was added to our account. And so 
the Lord, which exercises loving kindness and judgment and righteousness, he can now delight in those things because Christ exhibited those things perfectly. He exercised loving kindness and judgment and righteousness. Christ was those things. He delights in his son. And now because his, his righteousness is on our account, he can delight in us too. And then the last place we'll turn this morning as we bring this, we start to bring this message to a close is in Luke chapter 15. We started this message off pretty much by talking uh, from a, a few verses over there in Luke chapter 15. I think my Bible has Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 and verse 8. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. My parents used to teach me growing up in the church that whenever someone is baptized and joins the church, angels sing and Satan cries. I still believe that to this day. And I think it partially came from this passage here. There's another uh, analogy right behind it. But this one, the, I've heard that the uh, woman is an example of the Holy Spirit seeking um, one of the children. And as soon as he gets to the children, he regenerates them, makes them born again. And they repent. They find the gospel in this life. There's joy in heaven over that. They've been brought into the family. They're going to now start, also start acting like a member of the family. Thank God that they have found the gospel. Then, I want to take a look at the story of the prodigal son really quick. Verse 11, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. So you're dead to me. It's like you've died. I want my inheritance. And he divided unto them his living. Didn't fight it. And not many days after the younger son Many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for. Sometimes God will let you have it just so you can come to the end of yourself and he can prove that he is sufficient to take care of you. You didn't have it so bad after all. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. There is something called that people call the uh, ever diminishing rate of return seems like in this world you have to keep going deeper and deeper investing more and more money to keep getting excited over the same things tv shows movies um i remember the first time i saw you know some violence on tv i was like oh it wasn't even that bad now that i think about it but nowadays you turn on tv and there's such violent perverse things that they're just on everyday television and it's that shock value. They want people to keep coming back to their shows, and so they have to keep putting more and more crazy things on there. But it just it runs out. There's a mighty famine in that land. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. There isn't even a promise of payment for doing this. The world can't promise us much whenever we, we serve them, we, when we take part in what they're doing. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks of the swine that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. All of your friends can disappear as soon as your wallet gets empty. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? He's like, What am I doing here? My father has plenty. He loved me. Why am I out here? He came to himself. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. There's grace in those words. I, I can feel, I can I relate to that very easily at times in my life that I've realized how far I've fallen. I'm not worthy to be called a son. But it's not my works that deserve to be called a son. It's Christ's work. And he rose and came to his father. And then get this. 
But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Back in the first century, around that time period, the good man of the house, the leader of the house, the patriarch, um, they did not run for any reason. They had servants run. Running was looked deemed like a uh, subordinate action. You had servants go run and do that task for you. You never ran, especially while he's wearing this long toga, this long gown-like thing. He would have had to gird that up. And this father's probably kind of, you know, um, he would have had to gird that up. And this would have been not really a pretty sight for him to run across the yard, with a big yard, to run out there and fall on his son's neck and kiss him. The father went through a bit of humiliation for the sake of his son, for the sake of one of his children. We read in Philippians chapter 2 how Christ faced humiliation for our sake. He faced humiliation for us. So God felt some humiliation when he was on that cross. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be married. Mary, he says, he wants to bring forth the, hither the fatted calf, and kill it, let it be eat, be merry, because the father wanted to have a good dinner? No, he wanted to celebrate with his son. God wants you. God is not a God that tolerates you. I want you to understand that. God is a God who loves you and takes delight in his children, especially whenever we turn from this world and we follow after him. I hope that these words have been some encouragement and comfort to you. Um, if you would, please bow with me as we close in a word of prayer. Most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, thank you for another beautiful day. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather here together. Help us, Father, to never take the blessings that we have for granted, to delight more often in the things that you get excited about, to delight in the same things that you delight in. Yes, this world, it bores us. But there are so many things that you have called us to do here in this world. And by following your word, we've got, we've got so much to do. We've got so much light to let shine. We've got to be the salt of the earth. And to do that, we've got to have your spirit in us to let it flow out from us, to show joy, peace, love, the fruit of the spirit, to let that flow to others. Help us let that light shine to others. Thank you, Father, for this service that has gone before. Please be with us now as we close the service. In Jesus' name, amen.